William Booth is truly one of my faith heroes. He started off in a non-Christian home. He became a Christian in a local church and immediately became zealous for the faith. He left his denomination because of the lack of opportunity to preach and the lack of support for his cause. Booth became an independent preacher facing times of trial where he had no money and public opinion was against him. His faith in Christ grew as Christ Strength, uh, as Christ's strength carried him forward to do the job that was placed before him. A committed woman would become his main support. They were married till death separated them. Before Booth became popular, God had prepared many people to take on the cause of Christ, and this group was won over by Booth's heavenly vision. He started the Salvation Army, and in a short time it became an international organization helping people know the Lord, and helping people with the basic cardinal needs. He wrote Christian material to share his vision with others. At his death, the world mourned with 150,000 people walking by his coffin and 40,000 people attending the memorial. Truly, he was a great man, and his life was one of faith, trial, persecution, justice, wonder, an adventure. William Booth was born in the year 1836. He was born in Snyton, Nottingham, England, to a family that was well off. His mother and father were not very religious people, however they operated within the Christian culture of the time. Unfortunately, his father made some bad financial decisions at one point, and the family became bankrupt. This sent the family spiraling into poverty, which they were never able to come out of. Most of Booth's younger years were spent in this desperate situation, which resulted in him being uh, pressured to get employment at a young age to help his family pay the bills. This was a challenge for such a young person, but Booth seemed up to it. When Booth was 13 years old, he secured employment at a pawnbroker within the organization of Walworth. The income from <coughs> this job made a great contribution to his family. Taking care of the bills, in addition to paying for desperately needed items for the household, the Booths faced one challenge after another, and when William was 14 years old, the unthinkable happened. The main breadwinner of the household, his father, died. William Booth did not respect his father that much. He would always refer to him as a grab a get. This impression that he had was as the result of the negative aspects of his father's personality being emphasized in Booth's eyes. At the age of 15, he was invited to a service at a Methodist church by a couple that knew his family well. This couple were members of this church and were active in trying to lead others to Christ. Because of England's history, there were various types of Christian denominations throughout the country. During the church service he was attending, the preacher struck a chord in Booth, and he was compelled to go to the altar to give his life to Christ. Shortly after, he became a member of this Wesleyan chapel of Nottingham. He quickly embraced Methodist teachings. Booth is quoted as saying, In my anxiety to get into the right way, I joined the Methodist church, and attended the class meetings to sing and pray and speak with the rest. One of the hallmarks of Booth's life was preaching. Shortly after he became a believer, he had a compulsion to preach. A zealousness for preaching the gospel to the unsaved overwhelmed him shortly after he heard about a successful American evangelist that started a revival in the area in which he lived. This information was part of what caused the preaching aspect of his vocation to take off. Booth was strongly affected by certain theologians that became a controlling figures in his, uh, in his development as a preacher. He became powerfully influenced by the scientific revivalism of Charles G. Fin uh, Finney and gave a lifetime commitment to the study of it. Booth considered himself to be a uh, successor of John Wesley and Booth's theology followed a similar path to that of Wesley. Two more of his faith heroes were James 
Kai and Phoebe Palmer. On top of those influential people, his theology was heavily influenced and altered by the tasks he took on. For example, after he started preaching the gospel, he wanted to leave his job because he considered it sinful. Booth said, But all the time the inward light revealed to me that I must not only renounce everything I knew to be sinful, but make restitution. So far as I, can, so far as I had the ability for any wrong that I have done to others before I could find peace with God. In 1849, he left Nottingham to look for a preaching job. There were few, few preaching jobs, but Booth preferred open-air evangelism in the poorer areas of town. He did eventually get on as a Reformed Methodist minister at the Reformed Church of Spalding, where he was also ordained. This church was associated with the Methodist New Connection. However, he became frustrated at only the few times he had to preach and eventually decided to become an independent preacher. During this period, he felt that preachers generally had their priorities wrong. He was disappointed with the preachers of the time and st uh, stated they should be losing the chains of injustice, freeing the captives of the oppressed, sharing food and home, clothing the naked, and carrying out family responsibilities. Many preachers were distracted by the affluent in society and concerned about maintaining their possessions and their status within their communities. Therefore, they were not interested in going into areas of London like the East Side where poverty and substance abuse prevailed. Those people on the East Side had no means to support these ministers and hanging out in these poverty-stricken areas would destroy the preacher's reputation within the denomination they were a part of. When William started teaching about sanctification, he followed the Wesleyan model. This model consisted of justification by faith being the beginning of redemption. After this event, the believer begins to grow in grace, the grace of God, to the point of fully realizing what perfect love is when filled it, with it. And then, according to Wesley, that full divine conformity to all my Savior's righteous will. This will enable the believer to, uh, to be free from sin and be able to perform the deeds of the kingdom properly. This type of teaching is also referred to as the holiest movement, holiness movement. Later, he became convinced that God also purified groups of people as well, as the individual to perform his tasks, um, as well as the individual to perform his tasks. Later, <coughs> when the Salvation Army was formed, he referred to this organization as a creation of the Holy Spirit. He kept charging his people to watch and be ready for the Holy Spirit to burn within them and to motivate them to serve. The theology of the kingdom of God was integrated into his work. He saw the kingdom of God as being victory over evil for eternity. Looking forward to the kingdom of God and, his, and its completion gave the Salvation Army a purpose to exist. The workers had a belief that they were the primary group that would help establish such a kingdom. His view of post-millennialism gave more support to, his, to these teachings <coughs> because of its focus. This belief taught that the Salvation Army was going to prepare everything for Christ to come and reign on earth. This would be the full realization of Christ's kingdom of God coming. He instructed his followers to pray for this. This belief was common among believers at this point in history. Booth believed in the millennial kingdom, which would establish righteousness in all factors of life. The business owner uh, would practice it perfectly. Governments and families would display perfect righteousness in all decisions they make. Human suffering and evil would cease to exist, and we would be living in perfect peace with our Creator by way of Christ as our King. In an article, Booth imagined the millennium or the ultimate triumph of Salvation Army principles, that first we should have Hyde Park roofed in with towers climbing toward the stars as the world's great grand central temple. 
Only think what this would mean. And then, what demonstrations, what processions, what mighty assemblies, what grand reviews, what crowded streets, impassable with the joy, joyful multitude marching to and fro. Booth's idea of salvation was twofold. He believed in the salvation of the individual, and to add to that, he taught about the social reform as an addition to salvation. He referred to this as the salvation of both worlds. Booth is also quoted as saying, as Christ came to call not saints but sinners to repentance, so the new message of temporal salvation, of salvation from pinching poverty, from rags and misery, must be offered to all. To make a simple conclusion to Booth's theology would be three acts. Act of one, the, or act one is personal, individual salvation of God making the individual holy and being uh, and able to do his will. The second act would be God making the group holy and Christians corporately performing God's wishes. Finally, the third act is the millennial reign of Christ being ushered into the world. This was the one, or this was one of the main visions that drove Booth and became incorporated into the structure of the Salvation Army. You have heard the saying that behind every good man there is a good woman. This was true, uh, certainly true for Booth. Even though he was focused and had very little time for distractions, he couldn't avoid meeting the love of his life. It is ironic that he met Catherine Mumford in 1852 when he was invited to her church to do one of his favorite activities, preach. The second time uh, was uh, <clears throat> on one of his favorite days of the year in that same year, which is Good Friday. Catherine grew up in a very devoted Christian home, and by the time she was 12 years old, she had already read the Bible through completely eight times. When she was 14, she overcame a serious illness, and then after a couple years of deep contemplation, she became a believer at the age of 16 years old. Booth and her differed in their views somewhat. He viewed women as the weaker sex and was convinced they shouldn't preach. She was offended by the, the belief that women were the weaker sex and was supportive of women becoming preachers. Even though they had this conflict, however, they still got married in June of 1855 in a South London congregation chapel. The one thing that united them was their belief of social reform. Even their wedding was very impressive because they did not want to waste any money on something vain when the money could be better spent and invested in the needy of society. At first, she was very nervous preaching regularly, so she built up her confidence and ability by teaching in children's ministries. In 1860, at Gates Head, a compulsion came upon Catherine, and she started to preach when there was an opportunity for individuals to declare their, their testimony publicly. The quality of the sermon was so good that Booth decided to change his mind about women preaching. From that point on, he saw no reason to make a distinction between men and women preachers. The message was the same, only the tool that God used was different. This is a radical change of William's thinking, because he had heard other women preach before, and he was not impressed by them. He and his wife opened the White Chapel Christian Mission in, in London's East Side and the Christian Revival Society in 1865. The Booths preached in this uh, in uh, naphtha lit tents on unused burial grounds, some that belonged to the Quakers, in haylofts, in rooms behind a pigeon shop, and so forth. He preached anywhere to fulfill his famous words, go for souls and go for the worst. East London in the 1860s was, in the words of one writer, 
a squalid labyrinth with half a million people, 290 to the acre. Every fifth house was a gin shop, and the most and most had special steps to help even the tiniest children reach the counter. In 1972, he started the Food for the Million shop, where people could buy cheap meals. They struggled frequently to raise sufficient funds to keep going. Even still, they continued to help the poor in the poorest areas of London. London's east side was the main area in which William Booth started his mission. In 1977, one of Booth's assistants, Elijah Cadman, advertised events in the Whitby using the name the Hallelujah Army Fighting for God. He was the one that first started referring to William Booth as the general. This was a name that stuck. At first, William did not like to be referred to as the general. However, the name stuck and he quickly accepted it. Booth became the founder and first general of the Salvation Army in 1878 and organized it with a military emphasis with the ministers being recognized as officers. Along with this came the first volume of orders and regulations for the Salvation Army. Catherine became known as the Army Mother. She was also the one that designed the flag. In 1979, there were 81 various types of Salvation Army places with 127 full-time preachers. In addition, the Salvation Army Band, which was structured similar to a military band, was started in Salisbury in the same time period. The Salvation Army, by the direction of William Booth, would add Christian words to popular tunes of the time sung in local pubs. The general promoted the idea of why should the devil have all the good music. During the 1970s, a singer by the name of Larry Normer, Norman made a song with that very name. Booth is quoted as saying, Secular music, do you say, belongs to the devil? Does it? Well, if it did, I would plunder him for it. For he has no right to a single note of the whole seven. Many people had idea uh, many pe people and ideas were added to the organization as the organization developed the paid preachers would wear uniforms with ranks and eventually volunteers would do the same this uniform came about in 1880 and they opened up a new international headquarters in 1881 in London in 1984 or 1884 they had 900 different locations, and 260 were outside of Britain. The Salvation Army's formation was a, was a big step at this time concerning women's equality issues. The Salvation Army gave women equal rights within the organization in regard to caring f for the welfare of the poor and delivering sermons. They had Christian meetings on the east side of London every evening and Sunday mornings. In 1887, after seeing men who appeared to be homeless on London Bridge, Booth got the Salvation Army involved with social work. In London, in one year, he reported, 2,157 people had been found dead. 2,297 uh, uh, had committed suicide. 30,000 were living in prostitution. 160,000 had been convicted of drunkenness, and more than 900,000 were classed as paupers. This organization became committed to helping the poorest and the most neglected. These events were happening, and the issues were brought into the public eye during the Victorian age, and there were other more prominent preachers that <coughs> made Booth look like an antichrist in the public's eyes, and some of his officers were even arrested for preaching in public places. 
One of the ways they sought to improve the working conditions of women was by improving the tip of matches that were being sold. The matches of the time were made of yellow phosphorus, which would cause neurosis of the bone. Many women died of this. However, if you were to make the match tips from the less harmful, harmful red phosphorus, they would cost more and less people would buy them. So in 1891, the Salvation Army opened up a matchmaking company using red phosphorus and paid its female workers twice that of the competition. The workers of this new company started manufacturing 6 million matches a year within a short time, uh, which was impressive during that period in history. After a while, he started a public relations campaign by taking journalists uh, to tour his factory versus other factories and also brought them into the homes of the competition factory workers. Through this, he was able to bring about social change by changing what matches people had a habit of buying. The Salvation Army became a global organization reaching into the most, most of the British Empire and the United States of America. Booth ended up traveling to 58 different countries and became very well known to his con uh, contemporaries. In 1890, he published the books in, uh, in Darkest England and The Way Out. In his book, Booth planned farm colonies, missing persons bureaus, a poor man's bank, legal aid for the poor. He even set up a match factory to help expose the evils of the private empire, uh, uh, emperor <coughs> enterprise firms in that same line of business. Interestingly enough, before Booth died, the first parole officer in Canada was a Salvation Army officer. Eventually, public opinion of Booth changed, and he became, <coughs> or he began to get public re recognition for his activities. In 1901 or 1902, his public relation, uh, re public recognition grew to the point that he attended the coronation of Edward the Seventh by invitation. In 1890, <coughs> after he finished his books. Catherine died of cancer, and in a short address, Booth gave her over to the Lord while holding her hand and giving her a final kiss beho before she stopped breathing. In the year 1912, Booth's eldest son took over as general of the, of the Salvation Army when William died. He died at the age of 83 in Hadleywood, London. 150,000 people walked by his coffin and 40,000 people attended his memorial. In his life, he had traveled more than 8 million kilometers and spoke to more than 60,000 events. At the time of his death, there were uh, or had been more than 16,000 officers serving in his army. In the Old Testament, Elijah thought that he was alone. However, the Lord had used Obadiah to, uh, to ensure this was not true. In 1 Kings 18.13, it says, Certainly, my master is aware of what I did when Jezebel was killing the Lord's prophets. I hid 100 of the Lord's prophets in two caves, in two groups of 50, and I brought them uh, food and water. Just like the Lord prepared a team of prophets to be employed when Elijah returned, there seemed to be a team of preachers ready to be organized and waiting for someone with a vision like that of Booth's. To conclude, when Booth was a teenager, he was so poor he had to get a job to help his family. It seems that God used this to teach him to have empathy for the poor. At 14 years old, he became a zealous Christian and took over preaching the gospel. His empathy for the poor and zero tolerance for the greedy became clear early in his ministry when he dropped his church and went to the east side of London to reach out to those in need. The vision that it seemed God gave him became a controlling factor in his life and won the hearts of many, other belie er, won the hearts of many 
other believers. God gave him a faithful wife, which was also his best friend, to help him. Together, God used them to start the Salvation Army, which developed uh, worldwide fame in a short time because of its compassion toward the poor and the needy. His persecutors turned into his supporters. And when he died, countless people mourned him around the world. He was a hero of the faith.